And there you have it, the morning paper. This is a website and the guy is basically committing himself to reading a paper every day. He's not like always doing that, but close enough. And this is the, um, well, the one that um, was on the top and also the most interesting, I think. So this, this, this paper tries to answer, uh, how do committees invent? Uh, wait. Right, and what he actually does is he reads the entire paper. So this guy, Akaliti or something, Akoiler, I don't know how to pronounce that. But he reads the entire paper and then um, he gives basically a summary of it. So unlike last time where we would just like plow through the entire thing, um, we would just uh, go through the summary instead, which is nice because, you know, then we get a gist out of it without having to go through the technical details, which is what I like, which is what I like. And you know, if you want to go for details, the paper is linked there. Um, so, you know, if you, if you want to, you can, um, you can read that. This is the, well, this is the, the website actually. Let's let, let, let me link it in chat for you. You can visit if you, if you want, if you want. Okay, cool. So how do committees event? Conway's Database Magazine 1968. This is a paper from 1968. How about that? With thanks to Chris Frost for recommending this paper. Another great example of a case where a well-known law, Conway's law in this case, but many of us have not actually read the original ideas behind it. We're back in 1968, a time when it was taken for granted that before building a system, it was necessary to design it. So like, you know, waterfall way of the thinking, I guess. The systems under discussions are not restricted to computer systems either, by the way. One example of a system is the public transport network. Designs are produced by people and sets people working on a design are part of a design organization. And the set of people working on a design are part of the design organization. Then the definition of design itself is quite interesting. That kind of intellectual activity which creates a whole form, it's the first part may be called the design of a system. Wait, what? That kind of an intellectual activity which creates a whole form from its diverse parts, a whole, right, an entire, okay. That kind of intellectual activity which creates a whole from its diverse parts may be called the design of a system. Okay, cool. When I think about design, I more naturally think about it the other way around. How to decompose the whole into a set of parts that will work together to accomplish the system of goals. But of course, Conway is right that those parts do have to fit together to produce the intended whole again. Right, so this is like the definition of design. Cool. Um, so you, you, you make some kind of plan to make everything fit together. And you can go from um, the whole back to its part or from the part back to the whole again. Uh, there are two things we need to be very at the very beginning of the process. An initial understanding of the system boundaries and any boundaries on the design and development process too. What's in scope and what's out of scope? A preliminary notion of how the system will be organized. Without this, we can't begin to break down the design work. Given a preliminary understanding of the system, it's possible to begin organizing the design team. Decisions taken at the early stage with limited information can have long lasting consequences. The very act of organizing a design team means that certain design decisions have already been made. Explicitly or otherwise. Given any design team organization, there is a class of design... Oh, actually, come to think of it, Conway Law... Um, like, this is completely random, but Conway's Law is the, the idea that you would uh, organize your... Like, the, the design of software is a direct reflection of the organization... Of the organization you work in so if you for example have a sales um if if your software set is set up like in a um a part of it will be like focused on sales and another part will be focused on production or something then you would also have like modules that work the same way in your software that's like a natural cause of it or something actually i've seen this as well in um, in practice okay that's a bit of a tangent but the very act of organizing design teams means that certain design decisions already have been made, explicitly or otherwise. Given any design team organization, there is a class of design alternative which cannot be effectively pursued by such an organization because the necessary communication paths do not exist. Therefore, there is no such thing as a design group which is both organized and unbiased. So because you already put a design team together, you already have a bias. That's what he's saying here. It's interesting. 
These days it's less likely that you have a dedicated design team. Even the seemingly obvious statement that it makes sense to at least partially design something before building it can feel like a controversial statement. Yeah, so this is like how, how different um, our culture has become, right? If you start designing something before actually building anything, it's kind of weird. So, yeah. But of course, we do not undertake design activities all the time. Perhaps informally and implicitly, sometimes more explicitly, we've just learned to take smaller steps with each design increment before getting feedback. If it helps, then the software context, if you mentally substitute design and development, every time Conway talks about design and design organization, I don't think you'll go too far wrong. Wait, what? Right. <laughs> like they used to talk about design and we talk about development. Of course, we do undertake design activities all the time, perhaps informally and implicitly. Yeah, we no longer make like explicit teams and we just do it step by step these, these days. At least we try to. Some organizations still don't still make design teams, I guess. Who knows? Uh, once you've got initial organization of the design and development team done, delegation of tasks can begin. Each delegation represents a narrow wing of someone's scope, with a cum commensurate narrowing of the class of design alternatives that can be. Con Wait, what? What does it even mean? <laughs> Corresponding in size or degree or in proportion. Okay. So with the corresponding in size or degree, narrowing of the class of design alternatives that can be considered. Along with the narrowing of individual scope, we also make a coordination problem. Coordination among task groups altogether it appears to lower the product although it appears to lower the productivity of the individual in small groups, provides the only possibility that the separate task group will be able to consolidate their efforts into a unified system design. So you need to coordinate, okay, thanks. Thanks for stating the obvious, I guess. <laughs> it's rare that reorganizes in the light of new discovered... In it's rare. It's a rare team that reorganizes in the light of new discovered information, even though it might suggest a better alternative. This point of view has produced the observation that there's never enough time to do something right, but there's also enough time to do it over. There's always enough time to do it over. <laughs> The most fundamental tools in a designer toolbox are decomposition and composition. The system as a whole is decomposed into smaller subsystems which are interconnected, composed. Haskell, man. You can do fun function composition. Each of these subsystems may in turn be further decomposed and then composed out of parts. Eventually we reach a level that is simple enough to be understood without a further sub subdivision. Of course there is... Well, can't you even go further? <laughs> um... Of course, there are, therefore, the most important decisions in a designer can a designer can make involve the criteria for decompose, decomposing a system into modules. But that's another story. Wait, this is a another paper. Oh, 1971. Well, I wanted to read old papers. Um, apparently, he's also doing that. Like the nice thing about these is that you actually know that they they are inf influential. You know, uh, a lot of people have read these. And like they, they're already trust tested by time. We're still talking about Conway's law. We're still talking about this design stuff. So this must be an important thing to learn about. That's what I like about reading old stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. If you keep up to date with the latest papers, then there's a fat chance it will not be relevant at all. Like we, for example, don't know if the backpack paper was that relevant, but this one will be. Okay. The different subsystems talk to each other through interfaces, a newly emerging term in 1968. Now if we think about systems composed of subsystems interfacing via interfaces, we'll find a parallel in the organization by making the following substitutions. Replace system by committee. Replace subsystem by subcommittee. Replace interface by coordinator. <laughs> Wait, what? Right, so the paper used to talk about uh, committees, subcommittees and coordinators. And if we talk about software, we can talk about a system, a subsystem, and interface. How about that? How do committees invent? How do systems invent? Invent. Hmm. I'll put it into more modern terms. I, I think you can also replace system by group, subsystem by team, interface by team leader. Hmm. Yeah, that's valid. 
We are now in a position to address the fundamental question of this article. Is there a predictable relationship between the graph structure of a design organization and the graph structure of a system in its of the system it designs? The answer is yes. So this is Conway's law. The relationship is so simple that in some cases it is an identity. <laughs> so if you would draw a graph of the the organization, like what I told, like you know, have a sales team, you got a, a production team, and maybe some other team. Um, that's like that graph structure will be the same as the software you're producing. So that's what this paper is talking about. This kind of st structure preserving relationship between the two sets of things is called a homomorphism. It's not an isomorphism, it's a homomorphism. So what's a homomorphism? Well, he just explained it, right? <laughs> but the fact that, like, okay. Uh, in algebra, a homomorphism is a structure preserving map between two algebraic structures. So you have the same structure, but you're not the same. Hmm. So an isomorphism, it means that you are the same. Uh, you just name differently. And a homomorphism, you preserve structure through the morphism. Okay, cool. By far my favorite part of the paper is the second half, where the implication of these homomorphisms are unpacked. It was Fred's book who actually coined the term Conway's Law in the Mythical Man Month, when referring to this paper. The mythical th thing about the person month, of course, is the illusion that person months are fungible commodities. Fungible? Like replaceable? Of goods contracted without an individual specimen being specified. Replaceable. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Replaceable commodities. A very tempting idea from the management perspective, but utterly wrong. Conway shows us why. The research unit's viewpoint would say that two people working for a year or 100 people working for a week are equal value. Now, you probably get way more out of these two people working for a rear year rather than. Uh, 100 people working for a week, right? Because <laughs> there's like a lot less overhead in talking to each other. But they are also saying that, that uh, above here, they're saying like, okay, um, you need to coordinate. And although like the individual may have less contribution by doing that, um, it's only, it's necessary to create a unified design. So that overhead you have to pay. But you can reduce the overhead by creating a smaller team and giving it more time. That's like a clever way of working around that. So, you know, if you want to... Um, Reduce costs in software. Make sure you're using smaller teams that uh, that get more time to develop something. Yeah, that's like something we can learn from that. Often that's not what. Uh, often there's like uh, some kind of urgency to get it done. But uh, where was I? From right, firm uh, uh, working or one of hundred people working for value. Assuming that two men and one hundred men cannot work in the same organization structure, this is in intuitively evident as we discussed below our homomorphism says that they will not design similar systems <laughs> yeah that's also true therefore the value of their efforts may not be even comparable from experience we know that the two men if they are well chosen and survive the experience will give us a better system assumptions which may be adequate for peeling potatoes and erecting brick walls feel for designing systems <laughs> yeah so if you're if you're peeling potatoes or erecting brick walls you can maybe do this but if you design some kind of system you can't do this because of the homomorphism and the stuff we talked about earlier we all understand this at some level but it's easy to forget plus there are organizational forces that that work against us we come to the early realization that systems will be large with the implication that it's going to take more than we like to design with the current team size. Organizational pressures then kick in to make to make irresistible the temptation to assign too many people to design an effort. Actually, this is also kind of interesting for startups. Like if you start a startup and you don't hire too fast, but you use your money, money to burn longer, you get like a better result. Hmm, you know. And like the, the system will be also uh, more cohesive, I guess, by if you take into good consideration the morphism there. Uh, as we add people and apply conventional management structures to their organization, the organizational communication structure begins to disintegrate. The homomorphism then ensures that the structure of the system will reflect the disintegration which has occurred in the design of the organization. 
The critical moment comes when the complexity has not yet been tamed and that the skills of the initial designer are being tested to the maximum. It is a natural temptation of the initial designer, the one who primarily designed concepts of the influence of the organization, the one whose preliminary design concepts influence the organization of the design effort, to delegate tasks when the apparent complexity of the system approaches its limit of comprehension. This is the turning point, of course. <laughs> I finally made it past the ads. Why are they ads? I don't. I didn't activate any ads. I don't. I hate those. <laughs> Why should why don't you use an ad blocker in any case? I'm not making any money off those ads. Don't worry about it. Please use an ad blocker. Uh, so we're reading the the paper that basically introduced Conway's law of um, if you design a system, the system will be similar in interfaces like the communication structure of the system. So like the, the people that are in this uh, system, like you have a sales team, you have a production team, then there's a fat chance your software will also have like a sales part and a production part. <laughs> so that's what we're reading right now. Uh, yeah. So then there's like a critical moment where the, the designer needs to start delegating, right? Because he is uh, being put under pressure to do more and he can't handle this on his own. So to delegate tasks when apparently the complexity of the system approaches the limit of comprehension. This is the turning point in the course of the design. Either he struggles to reduce the system to comprehensibility and wins, or else he loses control of it. And I actually have done this. I have delegated this and lost control of a part of a system. How unfortunate. Uh, once an organization has been stuffed and built, it's going to be used. Organizations have an incredible propensity for self-preservation. Probably the greatest single common factor behind many poorly designed systems now in existence has been the availability of a design organization in need of work. <laughs> the bureaucracy is expanding in face of the expanding bureaucracy. So organizations want to stick around and keep on working on stuff. Uh, that's what we're talking about here. That's kind of interesting. I've always had a preference for smaller teams consisting of highly skilled people over larger groups. This is also something that John Carmack is um, eager about, you know, like having small and focused teams. Revisiting Conway's Law as I put this write-up together, the more often overlooked observation that design organization structure doesn't just direct the design, but actually constrains the set of designs that can be contemplated strikes me most forcibly. Every person you add reduces your design options. <laughs> because you you need to uh, have that overhead and you need to, you know, you'll end up with that homomorphism, right? Um, so if you add more persons to your software development team, you will have less options in your designs. Because you need to delegate and you need to coordinate. Perhaps the most important thing therefore is to keep design organizations lean and flexible. Flexibility of an organization is important to effective design because the design you ha have now is rarely the best possible of all time. For all time. Of all time. For all time. Yes. Good thing you work alone. Eh? Yes, exactly. That's what I say. Like, you know, if you're a startup and you work alone, you are the most cost effective. Um, like, you you gain... Uh, well, probably you gain the best design, right? <laughs> if you're just a one-man show. Um... And that's like the analogy goes, if you if you put 100 people to work for one week on, on some software product versus two people for a year on some software, then you will end up with a better thing with those two people than with those 100 people. And like that, that's pretty obvious, I think. In fact, I, I started saying that... Uh, where's that 100 people? Week. The research students viewpoints would say that two people working for a year or 100 people working for a week are of equal value. And if you would design um, software with 100 people for a week, yeah, what would you end up with? You would end up with nothing. You wouldn't do anything. <laughs> I did when I worked from home. Yeah, it's cool, right? If you work on something alone, you can go very fast. It's, it's ridiculous how fast you can go. Compared to a team of five, it's already significantly slower. I think it's like half. And if you have like a team of 30 or 40, yeah, it's like you move so slow. Two-person team is my preference. Then yeah, then you have some 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 guy to uh, bounce the ideas off, I guess. 
That's also kind of nice to have. <laughs> now maybe you won't end up with reflex. <laughs> um, perhaps the most important thing, therefore, is to keep design uh, lean and flexible. Flexibility of organization is important to effective design because the design you have is the best possibility for all time. And so finally, the, the, like uh, one thing I want to say as well about those those team sizes is this is also why a company like Google it won't innovate. You know, they have so many people to coordinate with. It's just hard to do for them. I mean, I got insane. <laughs> yeah, it's also maybe good for mental health. And the other thing you can do is stream on Twitch. That also works for your mental health. Uh, you have people to talk to. But um, <laughs> let's not talk about that. Um, and so finally, in the third or to last paragraph, we find a formulation that has come to be known as Conway's Law. The basic formulation of this article is that organization which design system, in a broad sense used here, are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Conway's Law. But this is it. And yeah, I think this is pretty much true. <laughs> uh, Conway refers to the... Maybe not an open source though, because open source everything will become a mess. Wait, maybe, no, 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 because it's open source and, you know, everyone can just do whatever. Yeah, you'll end up with a mess, of course. Conway refers to the military style of organization structure each individual having most appropriately seven support on it, which pretty much the rule of thumb we still use today. Hmm. Okay, cool. We did it. We did it, Reddit. This is the paper I wanted to read. This was it. Well, we could read the entire paper, but I don't want to. Uh, he links to it. A colite. A coiler or something. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, there are pictures. Okay. On to the next phase of stream. Uh, I have a list. Let me see. Uh, no, this is not it. I think I'd like it is, right? Okay, we read the modding paper. Wait, can we? Yeah, of course. It's uh, basically Conway's Law, like the paper that introduced Conway's Law. Uh, okay, now 